so that these four noble truths are sometimes likened to a visit to the doctor. First noble truth, he says you are sick. Second noble truth, he tells you why you are sick. Third noble truth, he tells you you can be cured. Fourth noble truth, the cure. Now, for the cure to work, you have to take it. It's no good just buying medicine, <coughs> putting it on the shelf at home and looking at it. You've got to take it. And secondly, only you can take it. No one can do it for you. In that sense, to change the metaphor, it's like if your car breaks down, the mechanic comes to have a look at it. He tells you, yes, I know what the problem is. And then he hands you the toolkit. He tells you to get on with it. This fourth noble truth is the toolkit. We have to use it. And it's called the Noble Eightfold Path because it's made up of eight factors. And each factor does a job of supporting and developing the other factors. It's a path in the sense that we have to walk along it, but we don't have to perfect factor number one before we go on to factor number two, and then two before we go on to three. All of the factors can be practiced and developed at the same time. So, <clears throat> in this Noble Eightfold Path, the Buddha is avoiding the two extremes which he mentioned at the beginning of his first sermon. He said that indulgence in sense pleasures was one extreme, and the practice of self-mortification was the other extreme, as I mentioned at the beginning of the first sermon. So, this Noble Eightfold Path is a middle path, the middle way. And the Buddha was not an extremist in anything. He gave <clears throat> a simple teaching to a monk called Sona. Sona, in lay life, before he became a monk, had been a lute player. A lute is a stringed instrument. And he had said to Sona, when you played your lute, if you made the strings too tight, you did not get the right note. If you made the strings too slack, you also did not get the right note. You have to have the right balance between tension and slackness. So, again, this middle path is the avoidance of both of these extremes. The path I've written up here on the, on the board all start with the word samma. Samma is usually translated as right. Right in the sense that this is something leading to your welfare and the welfare of others. And um, we can see the very practical nature of a lot of his teaching. The Buddha did not want to come up with a lot of intellectual theories and have a lot of learned discussions. His teaching needs to be understood, of course, but above all, it has to be practiced. And the Buddha taught at different levels, depending on the degree of understanding of his audience. 
He said it was like the shelving of the sea, at the seashore. You can go down, walking into the sea, getting slowly deeper and deeper. You can go up to your knees, you can go up to the middle, you're up to here, if you want to. It's, it's your choice how deep you want to go into the sea. Similarly, these teachings can be taken at different levels. Sometimes people say the Buddha taught at three levels. The first was to teach us how to live a happier life in the here and now. The second is how to lay down the causes which will lead to a happy birth in the next or subsequent life. And the third was to enable us to attain the state of enlightenment, which is the ultimate goal. That brings to an end the cycle of birth and death, birth and death, birth and death. So, if the Buddha had only taught at the first level, then that Buddhism would be nothing more than just a, one, a one more therapy for helping people to get over their present problems. But his, his ultimate aim is this state of enlightenment. So, if we start working our way through this path, you can see it's subdivided into three groups. One is called Panya, another is Sila, and the last one is Samadhi. And this is the way in which classically the Eightfold Path is taught. This is something which I don't think the Buddha had this classification, but his followers came up with it. <coughs> the first, Panya, means wisdom. Sila means ethical conduct or virtuous conduct. And Samadhi means concentration. As usually taught, the path begins with sila, ethical behavior, getting under control your bodily actions and your verbal actions so that you do not cause any hurt or harm to other beings. Then, Samadhi section is the training of the mind and developing out of the mind training, there's the wisdom, Panya section. That is how, I think I might have mentioned last week, <coughs> the symbolism of a stupa. You know, these, these, these buildings which you find dotted around Buddhist countries. The stupa, or pagoda, has three sections. Did I mention this to you last week? Or? Yeah, because you're looking rather puzzled, so I just want to make sure. Yeah. Um, the base, the foundation, is sila. On top of that, you can build samadhi, and developing from that, is the pinnacle, Panya. But the way this Eightfold Path is presented when you read about it, it starts off with DT, Sankapa, and then the others. The Buddha's teaching, he was once asked to summarize. And he summarized it in three simple sentences. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, keep your mind pure. A 
doesn't sound very profound, but actually when you look into it in, in, in detail, it, it's a very, very profound teaching. But cease to do evil would be sila. Learn to do good, samadhi. Keep your mind pure, panya. So if we start with samaditi. Samaditi means right view or right understanding. The Buddha said, just as of the rising of the sun, the red morning sky is the forerunner and first indication, just so is right understanding the forerunner and first indication of karmically wholesome things. To begin with, we can say that right understanding is understanding of the Four Noble Truths. He said that uh, it is through not understanding, not penetrating the Four Noble Truths that we have run so long, wandered so long in this cycle of existence, both you and I. But when these Four Noble Truths are understood and penetrated, rooting out, rooted out, is the craving for existence. Destroyed is that which leads to renewed becoming, and there is no more coming to be. So, right understanding is there at the start of this Noble Eightfold Path, and it is there at an at a elementary level. When right understanding is fully developed, then it is the culmination of the Eightfold Path, pure wisdom, perfect wisdom perfect understanding, that is enlightenment. So we start off with a, an intellectual appreciation of the Buddha's teachings, but eventually we wish to experience them directly, the truth of these teachings. So this is, this is what the path involves, the development of our understanding. There are um, several kinds of right understanding, right understanding of the Four Noble Truths, right understanding of three or maybe four kinds of wrong understanding. The Buddha said we make four mistakes in our perception of things. We take what is impermanent to be permanent. That means we, we make the mistake of ascribing qualities of permanence to things which are inherently impermanent. Everything is changing, but we, we don't want to believe that. We don't want to face up to that, so we, we try to hold on to things thinking that maybe they will be permanent. That's the first mistaken form of perception. The second is that we take what is in fact a source of dukkha, unhappiness, to be a source of sukha, which is happiness. We think, for example, that we shall find lasting happiness from sensual pleasure. But we're mistaken. Sensual pleasures are not permanent. They don't lead to 
lasting happiness. Sooner or later, they fade away, they die away, or they stop. But we make the mistake of trying to find permanent happiness from these impermanent causes. Yes? What was the concern referring of Aristotle's asking that you can feel after having obtained the causes? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the thing? Uh, oh. The Buddha didn't say there was no such thing as pleasure or happiness. But he said, we can't find permanent happiness in an impermanent world. So, yes, if you have achieved something by right and justified means, yeah, if you're happy, good, I did that. Don't make the mistake, though, of thinking you've got ultimate happiness. You haven't. That won't last. So the mistake we make is to try to invest the idea of permanency onto things which are inherently impermanent. So we try to, th we try to find permanent happiness from impermanent causes. And <laughs> we can't do that. Has that answered the question? So we take the impermanent to be permanent. We take the unsatisfactory to be satisfactory. We take what is having no abiding permanent soul or self to have a permanent soul or self. Teaching in those days, we used the word Atman. Atman was something permanent, eternal, living inside us. Some people said it was located in the heart. Some people said it was the size of your thumb. And that survived after death. In other uh, teachings as well, there is a concept of soul or a self, something which is at the very heart, at the very center of our being, and which will survive death. And maybe in some cases, it will go on to a state of permanent happiness or unhappiness, or in other teachings, it will go on to another life. Uh, which eventually may lead to a state of permanent happiness. But the Buddha said, no, we do not have a soul or a self. He said, we're just these five groups of aggregates, these khandhas, which are changing, changing, changing all the time. They never stay the same for a moment, and you cannot find a soul or self or atman in these aggregates. And the fourth mistake we make with perception is to, is to see beauty in what is in fact unattractive. So those are kinds of wrong perception. Has anybody got a question so far? The third one is to ascribe, is to give to a being a concept of a soul or a self or an Atman, something which is permanent and everlasting. And that will survive the death of this body. And then different Religions teach different things. Some say you go off to an eternal heaven. Some say to an eternal hell. Some say you go to an intermediate state and you go to other intermediate states. But, so the, but at least they all agree that there's something which we can say is eternal. And the this, this, this 
Say again, please. Isn't this an example of mixture between polynomials and polynomials? Yes. We make the mistake of ascribing a quality of permanence to things which are impermanent. I mentioned it first because that was about things in general. But now we have a more specific example which is the notion of a self. So, I mean, you, you're right, it's, it's really an, another example, or a, sp a specific example of the doctrine of impermanence. But it's when it's applied to one's own being that people, <laughs> they, 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 they're not happy with this, with this concept because they like to have an idea that there's something inside me which is eternal. But when I, when, when, when my body dies, something's going to go on. It's not the end of existence. So it's, that, that's, that's one of them. Uh, that, that's a very deep and difficult issue to, to not only to explain, but to, um, to understand. And it's a, there's a very, very deep-seated notion of I or me, which is not easy to dislodge. So, if we understand things right, then we shall think right. And that is the second of the factors, sama sankappa, right thought, right intention, right Aspiration is another uh, word for it. So this is a more dynamic quality than right understanding. Now we're actively training the mind. It's, this is an aspiration to see things correctly, to know the truth. And in this, this right thought, the Buddha gave supreme importance to the mind in his teaching. And we have a little body of uh, verses collected together into a very popular book called the Dhamma Pada. And I will just repeat to you the first two verses of the Dhamma Pada. It says, Mind is the forerunner of all evil states. Mind is chief, mind made are they. If one speaks or acts with a wicked mind, suffering follows one even as the wheel follows the hoof of the draft ox. So, mind is the forerunner. There, ha there has to be something going on in the mind before one speaks or acts. So that is why mind is in the, the prime place. And the second verse is the opposite of this. Uh, mind is the forerunner of all good states. First one was mind is the forerunner of all bad states. This is mind is the forerunner of good states. Mind is chief, mind made are they. If one speaks or acts with a pure mind, then happiness follows one even as one's shadow, which never leaves. So in the first verse, suffering follows as the wheel follows the hoof of the draft ox. Pulling that wheel or pulling the cart is a burden. In the second verse, happiness follows like your shadow. Nobody has a problem to lift, carry their shadow. 
So the first two verses really set out the Buddha's teaching in a very uh, beautiful and very well-known way, very popular way. We can say that the opposite of right thought is wrong thought. Wrong thought is based on three roots. Loba, dosa, and moha. Loba is attachment, greed, selfishness. Dosa is aversion, the direct opposite of loba. Dosa is hatred, anger, ill will. And moha is ignorance or non-understanding. It is because of ignorance that loba and dosa can arise. You can't have loba and dosa together at the same time, but they will always arise with moha. If it weren't for the ignorance, there wouldn't be the other two. Not qu talking about what? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, when we talk about ignorance in the Buddhist sense, it's not ignorance of not knowing how to make a rocket to fly to the moon. It is ignorance, and we have this little phrase, of things as they really are. And ignorance of things as they really are means seeing things as impermanent, unsatisfactory, and devoid of any soul or self. From Lobodosa Moha, you can find all other negative states of mind like the three primary colors, mix them together in various degrees, you get any other color. Here, mix these three together and you get any other negative state of mind. And so the opposite of these is aloba, adosa, a moha. Put an A in front, that makes the word negative. So non-greed non-hatred, non-delusion. So what we're trying to do is to eliminate the first three and to develop the second three. In particular, we can say that in right thought, there are three kinds. The first one is called Nekama, or renunciation. Renunciation can be, for a monk, a very extreme, dramatic affair. It's the giving up of all family ties, giving up of all material possessions, and ordaining for the rest of your life as a monk. But you can also take this word renunciation in another sense. It's the renunciation of loba, dosa, moha, making the commitment to try to eradicate loba and dosa and moha by applying yourself to the rest of the Noble Eightfold Path. I mean, you won't el eliminate them just by saying, I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to have any more loba or I'm not going to have any more dosa. You have to work on it, but it can be done. So um, we can also renounce um, sense pleasures, not in the extreme sense of giving them up entirely, 
but in acknowledging that sense pleasures will not give us permanent happiness. They will only give us temporary, limited happiness. So if we're trying to be realistic in what we expect from the outside world, as I said, we, we're not denying there can be pleasures in all sorts of activities and pursuits, but they will all be limited, they will all be temporary, they won't be permanent. So the first form of right thought would be renunciation. Above all, of negative qualities which will lead to the purification of the mind. The second form of right thought is metta. If you only carry away from me one thing from these evenings, I would ask you please to carry away metta. It is a most important quality which is not already in the mind, it has to be developed and practiced. Metta is the, the wish for the welfare and happiness of all sentient beings, including ourselves. So we can call it love, but usually it's translated as loving kindness. The problem is the English word love has different meanings. You have the love between the parent and child, love between a husband and wife, love between friends. <coughs> we also have, I love Mars bars and I love football. These are not all, the word love has a lot of different meanings. So, they usually have the notion of some kind of attachment. Because I love X, Y, or Z, I feel an attachment. This is not metta. This is not loving kindness. Loving kindness is without any attachment or expectation. It is impartial. It is not directed to one specific person or group of people. It is free from attachment. It is free from any desire to, to, to possess or, or to to control, it is being open to all beings and not making demands. Normally, um, our likes are conditional. I will like you, or I will love you, provided that you speak my language, or you stop playing your music so loudly, or you get your dog under control so it won't bite me. There's usually some condition there. Metta is unconditional. Metta, in that respect, is like the, the love which a mother has for her child. It doesn't have to be earned. It doesn't have to be justified. It is an extraordinary quality of unselfish behavior, which can lead even to the sacrifice of the mother's life to protect her child. Now that may be one or just a small number of children. So this quality of metta is generated towards all sentient beings.
Meta places no demands. It doesn't vary with whatever reaction it receives, whether it is um, an expectation that we were not expecting, uh, a result that we're not expecting, if, we, if there's anger or ill will coming back to us, that doesn't alter the quality of the metta. So we can call it loving kindness or loving friendliness, a, a, a feeling of goodwill. It is the direct opposite of dosa, anger, hatred, ill will, all of those can be uprooted by this quality of metta. The, the best um, definition I've, I've come across is in a book in, in the library where I come to. Buddhist meditation. Um, metta is not a temporary or evanescent exhibition of emotion. So it's not just an emotional thing. But a sustained and habitual mental attitude of service, goodwill, and friendship, which finds expression in deed, word, and thought. Maybe you're writing it down. Have you, have you got it all, or you want me to repeat it? Okay. So, this quality is not a relationship with a specific individual or group of individuals. It is sustained and habitual. So you can say it is, if you like, the default setting for the mind. If the mind has not got anything else to think about or worry about, then it can move into the metta mode. So you can generate this quality of goodwill. So this is not a relationship with a specific person or group of people. It's more, um, a st if you like, not, not falling in love, but standing in love, standing in goodwill, radiated impartially to all beings. Normally, we have our likes and we have our dislikes. Most people over there, they're okay, but the mom over that side, no. But if you think about the sun, when the sun shines, clear sky, everybody gets the warmth of the sun. The sun does not discriminate. It doesn't shine on you, but not on you, and you, and not on you. Similarly, metta is a quality we can radiate to all beings without any barriers, or limits which would place a limit, uh, uh, place a boundary on it. The downfall of metta is when the quality of pema develops. Pema, P-E-M-A. Pema is affection. Affection is not impartial. Affection is something we give towards one specific or group of people or one particular person. I have affection for this person. That is not loving kindness. That is limited. But there's no selfishness involved. So, I mentioned that um, there's no, it's the antidote to dosa 
but it's also the antidote to loba in the sense that the English word loved comes from the same root as loba. And with the English word love, there is an idea of this attachment. I love this. I'm going to hold on to it. But with metta, there's no concept of attachment. And this helps to overcome a lot of greed and selfishness. It helps to overcome a lot of anger and ill will. And there's a verse in the Dhammapada that says, Hatred ceases not by hatred. Hatred ceases only through love. This is an eternal law. So in the Buddha's teachings, there's no room for what we call righteous anger, that you somehow feel you are justified in getting angry. Uh, anger is never justified. We also talk about a just war. But again, this is not true. War is not justified. Any questions about metta? Not here? Okay. Um, there's a whole meditation practice which is used to develop this quality. I said at the beginning that we don't, we're not born with this quality in the mind. So we have to work on it. And one form of meditation is meditation on loving kindness. The deliberate generation in our mind of goodwill. We can start with ourselves because we're just as much deserving of metta as any other being and self is the dearest person to us so we can develop metta towards ourself and then we can radiate this outwards to more and more and more people up to a boundless degree the Buddha called it illimitable without limits Without limits in two things, in the strength of the loving kindness and without limits to the number of beings who can be embraced with these thoughts of pure goodwill. It might help you to think what the Buddha said about the succession of lives which we live. He said, it is not easy to find a being who has not been a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, a son or a daughter in this endless repetition of existence. So, because we've been going through so many lives, endlessly. We have all shared various close relationships before. There are 11 blessings which are um, attained by this practice. First is uh, the person practicing loving kindness will sleep happily. Secondly, he will awake happily. Thirdly, he will have no bad dreams. Number four, he's loved by human beings. And five, he is loved by non-human beings. Six, he is not harmed by poison fire, or weapons. It might need a bit, bit, of, a, bit of explanation. 
I think perhaps one interpretation is to say that if one is radiating loving-kindness sufficiently, other beings will not want to do any harmful action towards you. There was an example in the Buddha's lifetime, his uh, cousin, Devadatta, gave him many, many, many problems. And Devadatta wanted to take over leadership of this community of, of monks. And he tried to devise various plans to kill the Buddha, one of which was to let loose a drunken elephant which was charging at the Buddha. The Buddha's attendant, Ananda, tried to step in the path. But the Buddha said, no, don't worry about that. And the Buddha extended loving kindness towards this elephant sufficiently powerfully that they told the elephant, calm down, and there was no problem at all. So that's number number six. Number seven, he's protected by invisible deities. If you look at your chart of 31 planes of existence, there are heavenly beings, number six to 11. And so these are invisible deities. He concentrates easily. He develops a beautiful facial expression. Number 10, he dies peacefully. And number 11, if he has not already attained enlightenment, he will be reborn in a happy state. So that was the second kind of right thought. Third one is karuna, which is another extremely important quality. Compassion. This has a more active component than loving kindness. Loving kindness is the radiation of goodwill. Compassion is the seeing of the suffering undergone by other beings and wanting to do something to alleviate, to help. We went through this uh, with the First Noble Truth, the universal nature of dukkha, that every being in one way or another is experiencing dukkha. And when we look around us, we see so many forms of unhappiness that people have to endure. Mental unhappiness, physical unhappiness, unhappiness of their surroundings, unhappiness endured because of other people's actions. When we appreciate this universal nature of dukkha, then we can also feel compassion. Because we can say, I wouldn't like to be experiencing what that person is, is experiencing. So I can appreciate that they're not going to like it either. And this quality of compassion was exemplified above all by the Buddha. Once he had attained enlightenment, he didn't have to do anything else with his life. But in fact, he chose to spend 45 years the remainder of his life teaching out of compassion to other beings so they too could benefit from uh, his own uh, discovery. And when the, the Buddha sent out his first 60 monks to spread his teachings, he said, go now, monks, and wander for the good of the many, 
for the welfare of many, out of compassion for the world. So this quality of karuna is very important. Again, it's a quality which I don't think we're born with, but which we can develop if we spend some time pondering on the, the situation of all beings, ourself included. Just as the failure of metta is when attachment or pena develops, the failure of compassion is when sadness or sorrow develops. We have to think quite clearly here that compassion is a pure state of mind wanting to help others. When sadness or sorrow develops, that pure state of mind is now polluted by this negative state of sorrow. Sorrow doesn't help you, and it doesn't help anybody else either. It only muddles up your thought and prevents you from being really effective in what you say or do. So we need to be quite clear that just because we are feeling sad or sorrowful about someone's problems, that is not a measure of our compassion. There's a lovely little sutta called the Sala Sutta. Sala means a dart. And the Buddha talks about grief. Grief, which we feel about the loss of a loved person, friend, or whatever it is. And he says grief is a negative quality. Grief is like a dart, a dart that we stick into our own arm. Grief causes pain to us. It does not benefit anybody else. It doesn't benefit the deceased person. It doesn't benefit the deceased person's relatives. Grief is purely harmful. It's a measure, in fact, of our attachment, not a measure of our love. So when we are trying to develop compassion, we should not allow it to slide into sorrow or um, sadness. So that concludes panya. Now we've got to have a look at sila. Sila comes in three kinds. Some are vacha, some are kamanta, some are ajiva. Vacha means speech, right speech. This is an extremely important quality to learn to control what we say so that we do not use speech in a damaging fashion. We use speech in a positive, supportive, pleasant fashion. And so um, we have four kinds of wrong speech. The first is telling lies. The second is backbiting or tail bearing. The third is harsh or abusive speech. And the fourth is empty gossip. All of these constitute wrong speech. Telling lies is damaging. 
using backbiting and rumor mongering is a source of what's called breaking up of fellowship. It leads to disagreements. It's said to be like a mosquito. <coughs> it comes singing a pleasant song, but the mind is full of poison. The mosquito bites you and gives you malaria. The harsh language or abusive language is never justified. You can make whatever point you want to make without becoming abusive, using insult. Gossip is a slightly different order of wrong speech. Gossip is not necessarily directly damaging to other people. I mean, it might be if you're repeating something which perhaps is not true. But the real problem with gossip is that it doesn't lead anywhere. It's just, you're just wasting your time, just, just talking about rubbish of no importance or consequence. And we see this not only um, in speech, but we can also spend a lot of time reading gossip columns. A lot of the newspapers are full of gossip about this person or that person or that person. It doesn't really benefit anyone. So, um, there are said to be six kinds of speech. The first is false speech, not beneficial and not liked by others. So that's just a straight out lie. It's false, it doesn't benefit anybody and nobody likes to hear it. So that's wrong on every possible count. Then there is false speech, which also is not beneficial, but which is liked by some people. That means, for example, if I say to you, hey, I just heard something, some scandal involving X, Y, Z. And you'll say, oh, yeah, tell me. It's false, it's not beneficial, but some people like to hear it. Then there is speech which is true, not beneficial, and not liked by others. So that means saying something which is maybe disparaging about somebody else. I say to somebody, you know, you're a very ugly person. You look horrible. You know, the, the, the clothes you're wearing are disgusting. Could be true but it's not really beneficial, and it's not liked. Then we have speech which is true, not beneficial, but liked by some. So this is a bit similar to um, the second kind, although this is true, not false. But it may be true, it may be beneficial, but it's not, uh, not liked. Um, sorry, I have said true, not beneficial, and liked by some. Yes, some people like to hear this kind of speech, this, this kind of, uh, of um, language. But there's also speech which is true, beneficial, and not liked by some. So... The Buddha 
used that form of speech. He would criticize one of his monks. He would tell the monk, you are performing a bad action. Don't do that. Okay, he, that was true. He was saying it to benefit the monk, but the monk may not like to hear it. But that was the kind of speech, one kind of speech that the Buddha used. And then the best kind was, was the true, beneficial, and liked by others. So we need to consider carefully before we speak what is the likely effect of our words. Are we speaking the truth? Is what we say going to benefit others? And will they like it or not like it? Generally, that is not skillful speech. But I would agree that in some extreme circumstances, it may be better to tell a lie rather than uh, allow someone else to be hurt or injured or even killed. Is that the sort of thing you're thinking of? If, 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 uh, if, you, if, you're, um, if you're sheltering somebody in your home from a rampaging mob of people and they come demanding to know where this person is and have you seen him and you say, no, you're telling a lie. But is this, in fact, with the intention of protecting the person. Are we not talking about lying to a person to protect this person that is maybe uh, likely to be killed in the end? I don't think I've seen that movie, so give me give me more details. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen that, that particular movie, but as we shall learn when we get to the doctrine of Kama, the Buddha said it is the intention behind the action which is important. So if you perform an action with a good intention, then it is a good action. So to the external observer, he won't know whether you're performing a good action or a bad action because he won't know the state of your mind. But if you set off with a good intention, that is what makes the action wholesome. If you set off with a bad intention, if you set off with the intention to cause trouble or injury or so on, then that is, a, that is a, an unskillful action. So if your intention above all is to protect somebody, then you could say that, the, that your speech is justified. The Buddha said, if you cannot improve on silence, maintain a noble silence. So just think carefully before you say anything. He said that we are born with a hatchet in our mouth. Very easy to cut ourselves unless we're careful. Next, we have right action, kamanta. This means controlling our actions, particularly refraining from killing. We have um, <coughs> uh, the obligation to protect and to cherish living things, not to 
to fill them, fill them for pleasure, fill them for sport. Um, that, that is the, the, the opposite of that is generating loving kindness. You can't have loving kindness and a decision to kill. The question usually comes up, what about being a vegetarian? The Buddha was asked by Devadatta, his cousin, please, sir, will you make a rule that all monks must be vegetarians? And the Buddha said, no. He said, you may eat meat on three conditions. First, you have not seen the animal being killed specially for you. Two, you have not heard the animal being killed specially for you. Three, you have no doubts about it. The point being that monks depend upon the local community for all their food. They cannot exercise preferences. Anybody who wishes to make them a gift of food has to be allowed to. You can't say, no, I don't like that. No, I don't want, can't do that. Um, you, you have to accept whatever you are offered. You don't necessarily have to eat it, but you have to accept the offering. And so what, he, what the Buddha wanted to stop was people saying, ah, oh, we're going to kill this animal specially for you, sir, venerable so-and-so, or whatever it is. So come here tomorrow and you'll find we've, we've, we've We've killed an animal in your honor. That's what he wanted to stop. So, yes, the first form of right action is to avoid killing and to develop loving kindness, cherishing living things. Second form of wrong action is stealing. The, the, the term we use actually is taking anything which is not freely given. So it's a little bit broader than not stealing. If you walk down there now, you see on that table down there, plate of sandwiches. No one's looking at them. Oh, I think I'll have a sandwich. That has not been freely given. If somebody says to me, here, would you like a sandwich? I say, thank you very much. That's fine. But we don't take things bef just because we think we can get away with it. We don't use the telephone in the office for private purposes unless we are specifically told, yes, you can use the phone if you want to call a friend of yours, that's fine. But we don't remove anything or use anything unless we are invited to do so. So the opposite of that is to practice generosity, to practice giving, to practice um, the idea of non-attachment, offering other beings all sorts of whatever presents we can give. I have to say that in my experience this is a quality which is supremely displayed by Sri Lankans. They are the most amazing people when it comes to offering giving. Very, very, very generous. Very kind indeed. And um, particularly with, with food, but with other things as well. They're extremely generous. Third kind of wrong action is unlawful sexual intercourse. That for lay people generally means uh, the n not committing adultery, not 
taking actions which may hurt or harm other beings. Instead, practice contentment, being satisfied with whatever relationship you do have and will have. And then we have our jiva, livelihood, right livelihood. The Buddha mentioned five kinds of wrong livelihood. One, dealing in armaments and weapons. Two, dealing in animals to be killed. Three, dealing in human beings. Four, dealing in intoxicants. And five, dealing in poisons. In general, we can say we should not make our livelihood by dishonest means, by underhand means, by cheating, defrauding, taking advantage of other people. But instead, we should practice the positive virtues of, of honesty, kindness, fairness, The Buddha never said that it was wrong to accumulate wealth. Poverty is not a virtue. For lay people, he didn't say that wealth was in itself wrong. But wealth must be acquired by legitimate means, by fair dealing, by honesty, by avoidance of any double dealing or crookedness. And also, wealth, we should be prepared to spend generously on family and friends, not to hoard it like a miser. One of his most important lay supporters was a man called Anatha Pindika. He was the Bill Gates of his day. Very, very, very rich man. The Buddha never criticized Anatha Pindika because of his wealth. He frequently praised Anatha Pindika for the good life that he was leading. Praised Anatha Pindika for his understanding of points of doctrine. Anatha Pindika once gave a talk to somebody about a point of doctrine. And when the Buddhist heard about it later, he said, I could not have said anything better than what Anatha Pindika said. So you can have as much money as you wish, but make sure it's gained legitimately, and secondly, it is spent for the benefit of other people and good causes. The Buddha said that for lay people, there are four forms of happiness. The first form is the happiness that comes from the legitimate ownership of wealth. You can say, uh, I've got a lot of money in the bank, and I've got it all perfectly legally, perfectly legitimately, then that can be a source of happiness to you. Second source of happiness is the, the pleasure of spending the wealth for the benefit of other people, other beings, and generally for the good of the community. Thirdly, third form of happiness is the happiness that comes from being able to say, I have no debts. Since 
2,500 years have elapsed since the time of the Buddha, we've invented many more ways of getting into debt than um, they had at that time. But I don't think the Buddha said you should never get into debt. What he said was, if you can be free of debt, then you can feel happy about it. Sometimes maybe it's unavoidable to get into debt, but if you can, if you can have a debt-free life, then be happy. And then the fourth form of happiness is the happiness that comes from leading what he called a blameless life. The first three forms are not worth one sixteenth part of the fourth form. So a blameless life, a life for which other people cannot legitimately criticize you. Yes, the Buddha said, you will always find some people who will criticize you. But to have a blameless life means a life in which you don't do or say anything which is harmful to other beings. And we have what we call precepts, five precepts, or five rules of training that we use to guide our daily life. These are not commandments in the sense that if you break them, you will begin to get whacked over the head by the Buddha. They are undertaking that we try to live by on a daily basis. The first precept is to avoid or to refrain from the killing of living beings. The second precept is to refrain from taking what is not freely given. Third precept is to refrain from sexual misconduct. And the fourth precept is to refrain from the kinds of speech I mentioned, which is lying, tale-bearing, abusive speech, and gossip. So all of those first four precepts uh, we've already gone into. Number five is to refrain from the use of alcohol or drugs which intoxicate the mind. Uh, drugs which are used for medical purposes do not fall into that category. But the Buddha was... Um, encouraging us to develop the quality of what we call mindfulness, mindful awareness, guarding the mind. If you become intoxicated, <laughs> your mindfulness vanishes. And also, if you become intoxicated, then you have an excellent chance of breaking all the four previous precepts. So you go around fighting and yelling and shouting and doing all sorts of things. Are they allowed to use alcohol? No. no. So these are precepts which the Buddha gave us um, 2,500 years ago, and we still observe them today. They are usually taken on a daily basis. You remind yourself by repeating them every morning. That, okay, just for today. I'm not making... You know, to make a lifelong commitment is, is perhaps too onerous. But for today, I will train myself not to kill living beings. Take what is not given, as Sensei said. 
And if we can get to the end of the day, having kept our precepts, then we know that we cannot be legitimately criticized by others. And this is a foundation for peace of mind. I said that classically, it is sila which is taught before the other parts of the path. The peace of mind comes because we will not be troubled by thoughts of regret or remorse. Oh dear, I wish I hadn't said that, or oh dear, I shouldn't have done so and so. So these, these precepts give us guidelines. If we can keep these precepts, then we have nothing to fear from others. And others, more importantly, have nothing to fear from us. We're giving them freedom from fear because they know that you are not going to do anything which could hurt or harm them. This is a very wonderful thing. If you could go through the rest of your life without saying or doing anything that was ever harmful to any other sentient being, your life would have been well lived. So even if you don't get into the more um, in, into the deeper aspects of the Buddha's teaching, if you just leave, live a good life keeping your, your precepts, then your life is a benefit. The last three parts of the path come under the term samadhi. And the first is called sama vayama. Vayama means effort, right effort. This is not uh, a physical effort, it is a mental effort. And there are four kinds of right effort. The first is to prevent the arising of unwholesome states of mind which have not yet arisen. So that means guarding the mind with mindfulness. Guarding the mind so that thoughts of loba and dosa and moha do not arise. I think uh, some people at least, not everyone perhaps, but many people are, are very careful about what they allow their bodies to ingest. They watch their food, they think carefully about smoking, drinking, and they try not to pollute the body. They're not necessarily quite as um, careful about not polluting the mind. Any old rubbish can come into the mind. Like, as we've covered already, idle gossip. That's like wasting time on pursuits which are not of any great consequence or value. Um, hours collapsed in front of the television, just watching whatever rubbish comes along. We need to be more careful, perhaps, about preventing unwholesome states of mind from arising in the first place. The second form of right effort is to overcome unwholesome states of mind which have already arisen. So when we become aware that greed has arisen in the mind or anger has arisen in the mind, we try to take countermeasures to 
reduce and eventually overcome them. There are various practices that can be employed. One of which is simply to watch that state of mind. And if you watch carefully, not interfere, just watch anger, it will, of its own self, dissipate. It's only when you hold on to it, <laughs> and then you start allowing it to get bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. But if you just watch it, it's, oh, there's anger. It will, sooner or later, disappear. So the first two kinds of right effort are connected with negative states of mind. Stop them arising in the first place, root them out if they have already arisen. The other two states of right effort are concerned with wholesome states of mind. And so number three is to develop wholesome states of mind which have not yet arisen. So generate in the mind states like loving kindness and compassion. And then fourthly, to maintain, to perfect wholesome states of mind which have already arisen. So all of this effort is directed at the state of our mind and trying to keep it in a pure state and free from all sorts of psychic pollutants above all greed, hatred and ignorance. Then we come to Sama Sati. Sati means mindfulness. You may be well aware that um, this word mindfulness has in the last few years become a very fashionable term which is now entering mainstream conversation and is being used in all sorts of wonderful ways um, and some of them have no uh, direct reference to anything to do with Buddhism. That is debatable whether that's a good idea or not. You can say, well, if people actually benefit from learning about the practice of mindfulness, then that's good. On the other hand, you can say the Buddha did not teach, did not teach a noble one-fold path. He taught a noble eight-fold path. And therefore, mindfulness should not be taught separately from the other seven factors. So you can argue this either way. But in the Buddhist context, mindfulness means being aware from moment to moment what is going on in your mind or in your body. The Buddha gave a very comprehensive discourse on this. It's called the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. And these are four areas about which we can develop mindfulness. One is the body. You can be mindful, above all, of the breathing in and breathing out. We can be mindful of <coughs> walking. We can be mindful of eating. Be mindful of all the other movements of the body. We can be mindful of the decaying nature of a corpse. There are various subdivisions of mindfulness of the body. The, the second 
is the mindfulness of sensations, Vedana, which arise from moment to moment in both mind and body. Pleasant sensations, unpleasant sensations, neutral sensations, which arise either in the body or in the mind. They arise because one of our senses has come into contact with its appropriate object. So, a sound strikes the ear. A piece of food strikes the tongue. And that gives rise to a sensation, to a feeling of something which is happy or unhappy or pleasant or unpleasant or neutral. Third area about which we can be mindful is the mind itself. What is the state of my mind at the moment? Is it happy? Is it unhappy? Is it bored? Is it full of loving kindness? Is it full of anger? You can just watch the state of the mind. And then the fourth area is mindfulness of mental objects, which are really reflecting on different parts of the Buddha's teaching. When we come to talk about meditation, at the last class, we look further into all of these. Uh, but this gives you a little um, idea of what we mean by mindfulness. And then, yes? The third of the four foundations for mindfulness. Okay. Mindfulness of body, mindfulness of sensations or feelings, mindfulness of mind, that means reflecting on the condition in which our mind is at the moment. Is it angry? Is it happy? Is it full of generosity? Is it full of hatred? Is it full of impatience? Is it full of whatever, different states of mind. And the fourth one was mental objects, specifically different parts of the Buddha's teachings. So you can be mindful of the Four Noble Truths, mindful of the Noble Eightfold Path. You can reflect on them. You got that okay? Okay, we can't really have time to do full justice to the last one. Sama Samadhi. Samadhi is concentration. Holding the mind steady on a chosen object. Yeah, we have to have an elementary level of concentration in almost every activity that we do. You know, if you're going to brush your teeth, going to cut a slice of bread, you have to have concentration at an elementary level. But this develops into a much, much higher state. But I will start next week by a little bit of further explanation because it's nine o'clock now, so time to say thank you for your attendance. I wish you good night and ask somebody please to do a good job of washing up cups and mugs.